book of Psalms 119. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. And that's really what this psalm is all about. It's all about the depth, the pathos, the richness of your word. And how the writer here is just constantly moving us to the word. And how it fills us, how it incites us, how it guides us, directs us, chastens us. So many aspects in this incredible chapter. So we pray that over the next couple of weeks as we look at this chapter, you just flood our hearts with how important your word is and uh, that we just fall more in love with this great love, this collection of love letters to us that give us guidance and direction. Bless our time in your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and we all say amen. Now, last time, uh, of course, we had uh, Sammy Tanago with us last uh, Wednesday, but the Wednesday before that, we just finished at Psalm 118. And just backing up, first of all, Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. And then Psalm 118 and verse 8, we noted it's the actual middle verse of the Bible, if you don't remember that. Psalm 119 that we're going to look at tonight is the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, that's quite a lot. Um, true story, years ago in England, there was a custom, of course, of allowing a criminal uh, to read a psalm before his execution. Uh, when George Wishart came to the gallows, he actually chose Psalm 119. <laughs> now, listen to this, it gets better. He knew it was the longest psalm and the longest chapter in the Bible. And so as he got two thirds of the way through, his pardon arrived. And he was granted his freedom. So Wishart's knowledge of the Bible literally saved his life. I mean, had he chosen one Psalm, Psalm 117, he would have been gone. He would have been hung, you know. Now, Wishart, I would suggest he is not the only man that's been saved by Psalm 119. But many have turned from their sin, repented, uh, not because of its length, but because of its great content. It's all about the word of God. In fact, uh, the psalmist uses over 10 different synonyms throughout this psalm to refer to God's word. He calls it the law, the truth, the precepts, the way, the testimony, the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, and so forth. Uh, in fact, there's a synonym used for God's word in 173 out of 176 verses in the psalm. Pretty incredible. And, of course, God's word is the foundation of our walks as Christians. I love this quote by Thomas Brooks. I've often quoted it because it's so rich. He said, the word of the Lord is a light to guide you, a counselor to counsel you, a comforter to comfort you, a staff to support you, a sword to defend you, a physician to cure you, a robe to clothe you, and a crown to crown you. It truly is. Uh, this is why the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 15, 16, your word was found and it was to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, another thing about this psalm is that it's an acrostic psalm. Now, we've seen this before um, and that each you know, line in the other psalms actually begin with one of the you know, consecutive letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, here, though, it's different. Here, we have 22 stanzas in conjunction with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And you'll notice that each stanza, if it's outlined in your Bible that way, contains eight verses. And each of those eight verses also begin with that very letter. So you would have the first uh, stanza begins with the letter A, Aleph, in the Hebrew, as well as all those eight sentences within that. And then you go to Beth and you go so forth. Um, not only that, now you'd think that's a challenge to memorize that. I could do Psalm 117. But uh, did you know that the Hebrew children were actually taught this psalm to memorize? And that's why it was set as an acrostic. Um, that said, you might say this, the study in Psalm 119 is a study in the alphabet of God's love. 22 letters, 22 stanzas communicating God's love and truth to us. So there's a lot here. Now, we'll jump into it, and as I said, we'll just get through half of it. I think through maybe the first 11 uh, letters. Uh, but we begin with Aleph. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So there's a synonym. It's called the law. And the word walk, of course, speaks of one's manner of daily living. Uh, for example, in uh, 1 John 1, 17, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. 
<clears throat> and so here, God wants us to walk in his word. And he says in verse 2, blessed are those who keep, again, another synonym, his testimonies. And of course, Jesus said in John 13, 17, if you know these truths, blessed are you if you do them. So blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with, I like this, their whole heart. Isn't that great? Not a portion, not a part. Sometimes we just give God a little bit. I'm just going to give you this much today. But God wants it all of it all the time. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts. There's another synonym. And again, like I said, 173 verses will have a synonym of God's word. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. And that should be the heart of every single Christian, even as we're reading this. Lord, I want to do this. And I, just want to, I don't want to just know it. I actually want to do it. It's the heart of every believer. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with an uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. And of course, God never forsakes those who obey him. And God knows as sinners that we have a proclivity to fall. But here is an individual writing this saying, Lord, I long to walk closer with you. I want to know your word and apply it. And we're going to see that all through this psalm. Now we come to the second stanza and the letter Beth. And I love his opening statement. How can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young person, how can someone turn their life around? Here it is. By taking heed, doing according to your word. You see, God's word has a, a, a way to renew my mind, transform my character, uh, break old habits, create new habits, produce sensitivity, spawn self-discipline, develop faith, give new life. All that comes from God's word. And so again, he says in verse 10, with a whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander then from the commandments. I don't want to wander Therefore, and how, this is how you do it, this is how you don't wander from God's word, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The best way to keep from wandering away from God is get this in every single day. And, you know, I, it's good to remind you, whether you're a young Christian or maybe a Christian uh, for a few years or a long time, you know, how do you read the Bible? You just don't open up and do the turn and point method. What am I going to read this morning? There it is, you know, that you're not going to grow that way. So you take one book at a time, just as we teach one book at a time. Start, the best place to start if you're a young Christian is in the New Testament. Just go to the book of Matthew, read chapter one. If, you, if you're just digging it so much, read chapter two. If you're like, man, I'm really grooving this, read chapter three at night, chapter four, and just keep reading. Then go on to Mark and just read God's word and get it in. Then read the Old Testament and then, then just have this habit of constantly reading God's word. And it'll change your life. It's powerful. In Joshua 1.8, God told them, listen, don't let this law depart from your mouth, but meditate on it day and night, for then you will make your way prosperous and have good success. I mean, who doesn't want to be prosperous and have good success, right? I mean, we want all blessing from God. It's right here. Live this. Don't go for some get-rich-quick scheme or whatever. Just get yourself in God's word. He'll take care of you. Bless are you, O Lord, verse 12, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of my mouth. So I've, I've proclaimed your word with my mouth because I got it in me. It now comes out. I've rejoiced in the way of your testimony as, as much as all in all riches. Now think about that statement. Can you say that? Can you actually say, I believe God's word is more important to me than all the money I could possibly have. It's a pretty strong statement. Uh, Job said it. In Job 23 and verse 12, he says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So if I was given a choice, hey, am I going to have some meals maybe for the next few days or the next week or so, or God's word? I'll take God's word. Wow, that's, that's quite a statement. Because, listen, we need food. I mean, we never pass up an opportunity to eat. We just, some of you were here tonight eating, weren't you? But, you know, we love to eat. That's great. We get, you know, physically nourished. But we need to be spiritually nourished. And so verse 15, he says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself then in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Now, the third stanza, third letter is Gamel. 
Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. You know, when I open up God's word, I do see wondrous things. I mean, it's amazing of what God does. You know, he parts the Red Sea, brings water out of a rock. He brings victory when it seems like it's utter defeat. He raises the dead. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. wondrous things. Now he says, I'm a stranger on the earth, as we are too. The Bible tells us in the book of Peter, we're just sojourners, we're pilgrims, just passing through. Do not hide your commandments then from me, God. I want to do them. My soul breaks with longing for your judgment at all times. Again, do you long for this? I think of that great psalm, Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brook, so does my soul pant or thirst or long for you, O God. That's exactly what he's expressing here. You rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. And so remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So he is speaking of a time, obviously, where people in high up positions were mocking him. Uh, there was contempt towards him. But what does he do? That doesn't cause him, I will forget it, I'm giving up. No, that causes him to dig even further into the word of God. This, he says, becomes my counselor. You'll never get better advice than what you get right here. You'll never get better advice than what you get right here. You know, don't trust your feelings or how you feel from time. I like what someone said. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God, not all else is worth believing. I don't even trust myself, but I trust God's word. Now we come to the fourth stanza, and that's the letter Daleth. In verse 25, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have found that at times when I'm down and I'm just distraught over something or something's heavy on my heart or it's a trial or I'm concerned for somebody else, maybe my family or someone in the body. And I find that when I'm in a place like that, I come to God's word and I'm revived. And God's reminding me, I've got a plan. I'm going to work, Ron. Don't worry about it. I, I'm reminded to put my trust in him. And this is why we need the word, because so often we just stray, but then we're reminded, oh, that's right. Yes, Lord, that's right. You're right. And God works revival in our hearts. I've declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me to understand the way of your precepts. I like that. He, he longs to know. So shall I meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. And so again, there are times in the heaviness of life, we just feel like our souls are melting. Oh God, it's just too much. You know, it could be, uh, there could be the challenges of work, the challenges of marriage, the responsibilities of parenthood. It could be the common trials of life, you name it. All these can pile up and we feel the weight of it. How do we make it through the day? He says, strengthen me according to your word. I find myself in the morning strengthened. I find myself renewed. It's like, man, I'm going to hit the day. And maybe you wake up and it's a bad morning right off the bat, you know. The coffee ain't doing any good. But I, I'm in God's word. And I'm just reminded, trust me. Lean into me. And whenever you're discouraged, maybe it's in the middle of the day, you know. Keep a pocket Bible with you or have it on your, your app and your, you know, on your, your phone. And you read it and you're encouraged. He adds right here, remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously and I have chosen the way of truth. By the way, notice it's a choice. I've chosen the way of truth. God's not going to force you into compliance. He's just not, right? He's not going to make you obey his word. He's not going to even force you to read his word. But if you do, you're going to be blessed. And you can tell a person who reads the Bible and a person who doesn't. You, you, you say, well, I haven't been reading my Bible. Can people tell? Yeah. That's right. So, yes. That doesn't mean stay away. Oh, I'm not going to go there anymore. I've been no, what it means is be in, your word, be in the word of God because it affects everything. Your trust factor goes up. Your faith factor goes up. Your reliance on God, your joy goes up. Your peace goes up. Your confidence in him goes up. All those things change. 
And so the psalmist says, your judgments I have laid before you. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. I love this. So think about this. Just as physical running is good for our physical heart, cardiovascular training, so running the course, running according to God's truth and his word is good for our spiritual heart. Now let's move on to the next stanza. He is the letter. Teach me, verse 33, O Lord, the way of your statutes and I shall keep it till the end. And again, he had said it earlier, says it again, give me understanding and I will keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Now notice he doesn't just ask for mere knowledge. A person can fill their head with knowledge. We go to school, we fill our head with knowledge. But just because you have knowledge doesn't mean you have real understanding. Knowledge even about God is good. I, I understand that, you know. And, and you gain that as you read God's word. But understanding God's word enables us to see the character of God and what God is doing. Now, there are times where we may not understand what God is doing, right? There are times for sure. And then we just have to trust in the Lord. But as we begin to understand the nature of God and what he's all about, and as we understand and we see all the various stories of how God works in the Bible and how he worked in people's lives, we begin to see how he wants to work in our life. And that only comes as God gives us a deeper understanding as we're constantly in his word. He says, verse 35, make me to walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. Now, <clears throat> I find in here a paradox. I just kind of want to point it out. And, and it's several times in this psalm. But notice he says, he make me to walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. So the psalmist is asking God to make him do something that he actually likes. Uh, that's like a child saying to their mother, mom, would you please help me enjoy this ice cream? You really don't need to do that, right? Now, you have to encourage your children to enjoy their vegetables. I get that, right? So what is the psalmist saying? Well, what he's doing, he's describing the issue of his old nature versus his new nature. Um, Paul talked about this dilemma in Romans chapter 7, you know. He says, I delight to do the word of God in my inward man. Oh, I want to do it. But I also see another law warring in my members, bringing me into captivity, you know. And so the new man loves to obey God's commandments. I think we would all agree, I want to do God's. Yes, I want to do that. But on the other side, there's a war going against us. We get up in the morning, we're tired. I don't have time. I can't read the Bible, you know. And so the psalmist is saying, God, I need a higher discipline than myself. I need you to help me have a deeper longing for you. And I believe the Lord loves to answer that prayer. So pray that. Be honest with God. God, I'm, I'm just not disciplined. Help me to be more disciplined. Watch out. He'll answer that prayer. So he says, incline your heart to your test, incline my heart to your testimonies and do not, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Oh, that's a great request, right? The things of this world always look so appealing. The honors, the possessions, the pleasures, the profits of this world look so uh, delightful. But they, but they fade so quickly. And if our eyes are fastened on them constantly, then covetousness can settle in. And then we're just constantly wanting more. And if we're in that mindset, it kind of alienates us from God and what would please him. And we don't have to look any further than right at the fall with Eve as she was there tempted in the garden by the serpent looking at the tree. It tells us she saw that the tree was good for food and she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes and she partook. So this idea is like, oh, it looks so good. It looks so appealing. And that's what the word, world sometimes looks to us. If it's us as men, sometimes we go, oh man, I'd love to have that car. That car is awesome. Or that new gadget, I gotta have that gadget, man. Look at that, you know. It's shiny and sparkly, you know. It's gonna do cool stuff, you know. Or you're a woman, maybe it's the dress or the pair of shoes or whatever it is, right? But after you purchase it, it's just another dress. It's just another pair of shoes. Or for us as guys, it's just another gadget that it gets clutters up something, you know. And that doesn't mean we can't purchase things and have things. But what the psalmist is saying, I... 
I, I want my focus to be on you. So he says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things that really don't have any eternal value and revive me in your way. Verse 38, establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. That means to esteem God, to honor. That's, that's my passion. I want to put you first. And so turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. And so uh, perhaps he was being reproached by some enemies. We don't know the context, but he does say, Behold, I long for your precepts. I want to do what is right, so revive me in your righteousness. Now, moving on, we come to the, the letter Wa. And he says, verse 41, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for those who reproach me, for I trust in your word. So again, he picks up this subject of those who are reproaching him. And this can happen at any time in our lives. You know, it might be somebody at work. It could be a neighbor or falling out with somebody in your family, you know. And um, it's it's tough, you know, when, when people come against you. And boy... The things we're dealing with in just our society now, it's, it's an angry society. You know, the, the, the cancel culture going on and all the worldly philosophies and the various uh, clever arguments that people try to undermine different people and things and the Christians, of course. And so what do we do? We stand fast on this. I, I think of Martin Luther as he was standing on trial for just the truth of the scriptures he made this grand statement. He said, here I stand, I can do no else, so help me God. He was, gonna say, he was saying, I'm gonna stand on the scriptures, period. If you put me to death, fine. They tried to, he escaped, and, you know, but many others who were standing up for the word of God at that time in the 16th century were put to death for putting the word of God into the hands of the common people. We need to love it. We need to adhere to it in the malaise of our society today. Verse 43, and do not take the word of truth utterly from my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So God, I, I want you to be on my lips. And of course, God's word will be in our lips and in our mouth when it's hidden in our heart, right? Jesus even said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you get it tucked in, it's going to come out. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your, your precepts. I love that. There are those who look at the word of God and we talk to people, you know, from time to time and they'll say, well, the Bible is so restrictive and it's so restrictive. There's a bunch of rules and regulations. And man, if you, if you read the Bible, live by the Bible, you can't have any fun. Well, that's just not true. The fact is God's word is liberating. And on the other side, those who refuse to live according to God's word are in bondage. Enslaved by alcohol, drugs, pride, perversions, evil passions. So sin is never liberating. Sin is enslaving. Ask the person who is dying of liver failure because of their alcohol addiction. Ask the person who's lost everything because of their drug addiction. Ask the person who lost their family because of their sexual addiction. Sin enslaves. But when we apply the truth of God's word, there's, there's liberty. Jesus said this in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you're my disciples. So he says, you need to get in the word. And when you do that, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But again, he said that in the context of abiding in his word. Verse, 30, uh, verse 46, I should say. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Isn't that great? I'll stand before kings. And you know, we have many cases where men in the Bible, ordinary men, stood before kings. Moses did. Joseph did. Daniel did. Paul did. Many. Who knows what God will have you do? Who you'll have stand before if you just keep your testimony for Christ? Who knows the audience you may one day have? And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. So again, I love your commandments. And my hands I will also lift up your commandments, which I love. So God's word was intended for us to lift up our hearts to him and our praise to him, and I'll meditate on your statutes. Now we come to the next letter, Zayin, verse 49. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. That's another great term in connection with God's word. This is a book of hope. This book and the truth in it gives you hope for life now and the hope of eternal life forever. 
In fact, Romans 8 and verse 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You, you don't have to be condemned anymore. All your sin is forgiven. No condemnation. And then at the very end of Romans chapter 8, he goes on to say this, and I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things come nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So think about this. That whole chapter starts with no condemnation and it ends with no separation. Oh, that's hope. That gives us hope. Then he adds this in verse 50. This is my comfort. It gives me hope and comfort in affliction. For your word has given me life. I, I love that. Where do you get comfort for? Where do you go? Listen, most people in the world, when they're overwhelmed with something, well, if they're ill, they go to a doctor. If they need, they, they've got financial woes, they go to a loan officer. If they're being sued, they go to an attorney, right? If they're out of a job, they go to a placement center. If they're depressed, they go to a counselor. And, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with some of those things. But listen, the first place you want to go is right here. If you're a Christian, the first place you go when you're devastated, you don't have a job, you're ill, you're sick, or whatever's going on, you're married, you go here, here, and find comfort. This is the place we go first. And then he adds, your word has given me life. It, man, it has. It, we get born again through the truth of God's word, and it gives us perspective for everything. Now, the proud, he says, have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. So he was obviously dealing with opposition but he says that's not going to stop me i remembered your judgments of old O lord and have comforted myself so listen when you find yourself in a difficult situation just look back i remember the truths of all i remember how god has been faithful 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 and i'm going to keep my eyes on him i'm going to trust in him he adds in verse 53 indignation has taken hold of me why because of the wicked who forsake your law and, and that can happen to us as well. We can get very discouraged as Christians when we see all the stuff happening around us today, right? It's easy to, to, you know, see what's going on and, man, get frustrated. But the best thing to do is to trust God and to keep our eyes on him. He has a plan. He says, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I love that. Um, all my journeys... I have the song of your word. And again, the Psalms, of course, were actually set to music. And so one of the best things you can do just to get God's word in, of course, you can have worship music, which sings much of it of God's word. Or you can just, you know, plug in God's word, period, all the time. You know, uh, you can have a revive, our revive FM app, listen to music or listening to the teaching of God's word on there or get our app and listen to messages all the time. I love that, man. Get God's word in. And then he says, I remember your name in the night. Don't you love that? Have you had that before? You're just, you're, you can't sleep all night and you're just like, Lord, what am I to do? And you pray and you're remembering the Lord. You're turning to the Lord in the evening. Oh Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine. This is part of my life because I keep your precepts. Now we come to the eighth letter. That's Heth. And I love his opening statement. You are my portion, O oh Lord. It's all about you. You're my portion. You're my wealth. You're my riches. The world seeks for happiness and riches and wealth and honors like we talked about. It's so fleeting. But our satisfaction is found in God. He's our portion, his word. I have said that I would keep your words. I entreat your favor with my whole heart. Be merciful to me according to your word. I thought about my ways and turned my feet to your testimonies. So he says, I, I thought about my life and doing it my way. And it's not that good of a way. You now, Frank Sinatra sang that song, I did it my way. That's the world's testimony of the epitome of I'm going to do what I want, how I want. Yeah. How does that turn out? Not so good. So I thought about my ways, but then my feet, I turned around and went right to the word of God. That's, that's good counsel. I, I think of Jesus in, in John chapter 6, after many of the disciples walked away from him, when he expressed the truth of what it really meant to follow him, and then in verse 67, he turns to his disciples, those 12 chosen, and he says, are you going to leave as well? To which Peter said, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's a great declaration. I thought about my way. I don't need to go back to fishing. I, I want to I I be a fisher of men. 
Moving on, he says, I made haste and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have bound me, but I've not forgotten, my, forgotten your law. So I have people trying to bring me down, but I'm not going to stop holding on to your word. Sometimes that can trip people up. It's difficult things happen in their life. Maybe they lose a loved one or they get in an accident or certain events happen. They don't get the job, that dream job they always wanted. When that happens, I'm walking away from God. And right here, he says, look, at the cords of the wicked have bound me. That's, that's evil people. But still, I'm not going to forget your law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you. Isn't that something? In the midst of difficulty, to rise and say, thank you, Lord, because of your righteous judgments. I'm a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is the Lord, and it's full of your mercy. That's the truth. It's full, and God is a merciful God. Therefore, he says, teach me. Teach me about your mercy and your statutes. And then the 10th letter, uh, Teth. I'm not sure if this is 10th. Teth. You have dealt well. I like this. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Um, When things are going not so well, (laughs) it can go well with us because we have God's word. I love that. Um, Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for the good for those who love God. Joseph, of course, classic example. I mean, in his humanity, Joseph had a lot of things to complain about, to say, it's not so well, right? His brothers sell him into slavery. He gets accused falsely of rape. He's thrown into prison. He befriends the people there. They forget about him. But it's not till 17 years later, he's put to second in command of Egypt. God had a plan and it was well. Even though it didn't seem well, it was well. And so verse 66, teach me good judgment and your knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. How good that is. Lord, I trust and I believe in your word. And then these profound words, I love this, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Oh, isn't that good? Therein lies the benefit of affliction. When everything's going well, man, there's a tendency to, you know, forget about God and to drift. But when affliction comes to the believer, it causes us to run to God. Listen, Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we are like sheep and we go astray. So like a loving shepherd, sometimes God allows affliction and difficulty and trial to pull us back in. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, oh, now I keep your word. That's good. And you are good. And you do good. Teach me. Isn't that great? Even in his affliction, you say, God, you're a good God. When difficulty comes, that doesn't mean God isn't good. He didn't stop being good. He loves you. He has a plan in it. Now, the proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your, your precepts with my whole heart. Again, sometimes it's not just affliction. Sometimes it's people coming against us. And again, some people... Uh, fall away because of this. Maybe someone's attacking their character or they're spreading lies about him. It's like, man, I can't take it. I give up. He adds in verse 70, their heart is as fat as grease. That's an interesting phrase. Um, John Phillips writes, it's a life larded over with the flesh. That's, that's really probably the best way to describe it. In other words, they're just given to their own desires. The, the world and people are given to their own desires, but I delight in your law. And so he can say in verse 71, it's good for me that I've been afflicted. It's okay that I might learn your statutes. And then he concludes, the law of your mouth is better to me than a thousands of coins of gold and silver. So I'd rather have the riches of your word than the riches of this world. Wow, that's so good, isn't it? That's rich. Now, moving on, we come, this is the uh, 10th letter. This is Yod. Verse 73, your hands have made me and fashioned me. So you probably want to note here Psalm 139. That's a beautiful psalm when we get there. It tells us in Psalm 139, 13, God, you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. And I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he goes on to describe just how a baby is formed in his mother's womb. God fashioned us. And so give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you will be glad when they see me because I've hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Isn't that interesting? We think of God's faithfulness and other things. He came through in the right time, but we don't think of his faithfulness to afflict us. But he is. He has a plan in it. Let I pray your mercy, though, your kindness, 
Be for my comfort according to your word to your servant. Let your tender mercies come to me that I may live for your laws my delight. So look at these words. He's like, Lord, in the difficulty, be merciful, be kind, give me comfort, give me tender mercies. And that's good. We want that. And God does do that. Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully with falsehood. But I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. <clears throat> and so let those who reject you, the proud, be humble. And let those who fear you, that's believers, um, you know, join my cause, he's saying. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes that I may not be ashamed. And uh, let's look at one more. We'll look at Kaf. So this is the 11th letter. My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, when will you comfort me? Now, have you ever felt that? Have you ever been in a situation where, man, you're just like, I need to hear from God. And it's like, I'm not getting anything. Well, that's happened to me. And, I, and, I, and it's like, that's not by mistake. God is wanting me to dig more. God is wanting to press me more. God is saying, you're going to have to wait longer. Keep pressing me, Ron. For I've become like a wineskin in smoke. Now, what is he talking about? Well, uh, they would use animal skins as, uh, to make wine. And a lot of times in the process, they're kept outside for a long time. And when that happens, they can become very brittle and shriveled. And that's what he's saying. I'm becoming dry and shriveled yet. I do not forget your statutes. No matter what, even though I feel like I'm, I'm wasting away, Lord, I'm going to keep clinging to you. And then moving on, he talks about enemies, again, that persecute him. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who are persecuting me? So I'm not hearing from you. And then I got enemies coming against you. Lord, what's taking you so long? I felt that way before. But he says, the proud have dug pits for me which is not according to your law. Lord, that's not what you want. All your commandments are faithful. I trust in you, yet they persecute me wrongfully. Help me, help me. And they almost made an end of me on the earth. So they almost succeeded. But in all that, as hard as it got, and this is a good example for us, no matter how hard and difficult it gets, notice he says, I did not forsake your precepts. And so in the midst of overwhelming circumstances, we need to remember that this is our anchor. This is our anchor in troubled waters. This is our anchor in the storms of life. When the waves of persecution and sickness and despair and trauma, you name it, when it comes against us, we cling to this truth. This is our lifeline to God. And then he concludes, and this will be our last verse, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. So Lord, I, I want you to sustain me. My desire is to keep your word, make me a person of your word. So here we get halfway through the psalm. Again, it's all about the word. So if you wake up tomorrow and you forget to open up this book, I'm going to come over there and hit you upside the head. I'm just kidding. But so we want to be in God's word. Amen. Well, let's pray.